we are going to talk about Django, which should be, uh, it, there's a lot of steps, but it's a lot of fun. And it's also really what we've been kind of like building up to here in a lot of ways. Um, and we're going to use Django with all these other pieces that, that we've been learning about. Uh, though for the first week or so, we're really going to focus on Django. So Django's a backend, uh, really a web framework written in Python. Um, it's been around a while. It's what we call a batteries included framework, meaning it does an awful lot for you, but you have to use it the way that it wants to be used. It's got a very specific structure of folders and, and files. And there's a lot of like code that gets installed with the Django uh, framework and libraries that, that we leverage. So we have to use it in a very specific way. And again, like the metaphor here that I think is useful is, you know, like a shovel versus a giant crane or not crane, but, you know, a giant excavator scooper that you would use if you were building like a house or a big building. A shovel is easy to use and doesn't require much training at all. Uh, a giant ex excavator scooper does. Um, and Django is going to do a lot for us. Today, we're going to see something called Django ORM that helps us actually manage and generate SQL. So we won't be writing SQL directly. We actually use Python classes. Um, and we're going to see over the next week how to build an API with Django. Um, and just to very quickly illustrate here, um, and I'll make this bigger. Just to do a very, very rough illustration. This is now um, the architecture that we're moving towards, which uh, should be looking more and more familiar. And this should ring some bells. And I sort of drew a version of this from the other, uh, when we started looking at Postgres. Um, we're going to learn to build this piece in the middle, uh, this Django server. Um, it's going to do everything. It's going to be the first page that the user goes to in their browser that to get React. Uh, though we'll see later, we might break that into separate servers. It's going to talk to Postgres. Uh, we're going to see, we can even use Django to manage Postgres. Um, so there's a lot of, of cool stuff that, that we do with it. Um, however, again, this is a more complex tool and, and there is more setup. And the first piece that we need to learn in how to set up and install and run Django is a virtual environment. Um, and by the way, I'm going to start coding in a minute. Um, I'm going to move at a decent pace, but the intention here is not to code along. Um, there will be work time to, to work on assignments uh, this morning. So we've seen virtual environments a little bit. Um, they start to come into their own a bit more with Django. Um, it's a little bit artificial in class, but the real world context here is you might be working on multiple projects and one project might be using one version of Python because it's some legacy code and another project might be using a newer version of Python or, you know, even just sort of like for posterity's sake, it's really good to specify what version of, of a language 
we're using with projects. Because as we've started to see, like we saw with Postgres last week, it introduced some new behavior with um, something I can't remember, to be honest. And new features come out with new version, versions of languages. Like uh, Python 3.10 has something that's a little different than Python 3.8 and so on. Um, and same with Django as well and our other dependencies. Uh, one project might have one version of Django, another project might have another. And so the Python virtual environment solves this problem. Um, and in fact, let me just go ahead and start writing some, some code here. Actually, let's leave that up. Um, and I think what I'll do as, as folks who seemed to find this useful yesterday was um, I'll have my code up and then I'll also have the, the lesson up here if, if it helps people to, to see it that way. Um, but again, um, it, you know, I'm not going to, this is not explicitly a code along exercise. I think the most important thing is to take notes and there will be time, we'll have some work time on this. So actually, let me scroll up a bit here because I was jumping a bit ahead and we'll start at the very beginning, which is our virtual environments. Um, so to recap with the Python virtual environment, I'm going to create it um, in the directory that I want my project to be. And for me, I'm doing this in the demos and notes. Actually, let's move that into there. And actually, before I create my virtual environment, can anyone remind me, we've seen this a little bit, but not a lot. Um, what is a Python and virtual environment? Is it the same thing as like a virtual machine or Docker, or is it different? I think it just separates all the packages and stuff you install between each project so they don't interfere. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's, um, so here's the most important thing to remember about Python virtual environments, I think. Um, they're not that fancy. There's something called a virtual machine, that software that completely simulates another computer down to the hardware level. That is not what a Python virtual environment is. It is like the opposite of that. Um, a Python virtual environment is 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 actually pretty simple. It only affects our Python code. It doesn't affect anything else. Um, so let's let's go ahead and build one, and I'll I'll briefly kind of show what it is under the hood. But I'm not going to go spend too much time on it. The virtual in virtual environment. So what Python does is it makes some modifications to our shell environment that only affect Python. Specifically in the shell, there's this special shell variable called path, right? And shell variables have this dollar sign. And whenever I type a command, like for instance, psql um, lives in this applications slash Postgres slash app, blah, 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 blah. So I installed it in a slightly different way than with Homebrew. Uh, for most of you on Mac, you'll have installed it with Homebrew. Here in this path directory, separated by these colons, we see this path to this Postgres. So whenever you run one of these programs uh, from the command line, what your shell is doing is looking at this path variable and looking through all these directories to find, hey, is this program in one of these directories? Where does it live? Um, and the Python, Python is hiding in there somewhere too. Uh, if I look through this again, Somewhere in here, if I do which Python, uh, in fact, if I do which Python 3, it's in this slash op slash homebrew directory where all the homebrew stuff gets installed, um, opt homebrew bin, and we see that right here. And so all that the Python virtual environment does is modify that path. Um, and you don't, it's good to know, but you don't directly need to know this to do stuff. I just want to illustrate that a Python virtual environment is not uh, magic. So we used 
uh, the command Python dash M for module, and then V E N V, uh, which is using the virtual environment module. I recommend just naming your virtual environments dot V E N V as convention, and also because VS Code will pick up on that directory name. And if I type ls space dash a to show me files that start with a dot dot files, I've got a directory here named dot V E N V. Um, in fact, I'm also going to create a file named get ignore and ignore the .venv directory because we don't want to check in all of the stuff in there into version control. Um, and if I look inside here, I can actually see like, um, There's this activate script that we're about to run. And there's a lot of stuff in here, blah, 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 blah. But somewhere in here, like you can see, I think it's right here. We're modifying that shell path variable. And that's really the main thing that this virtual environment does. Um, the important things to know here is that it, it this only affects Python. It's not a full on like virtual machine or anything like that at all. We're just messing around with some of our shell variables and that we can activate a virtual environment and deactivate a virtual environment. I use this command. Um, so source is a command that runs uh, like shell scripts from the command line. There's a couple other ways to do this, but this is often how we'll do this. And note now my command prompt has this dot venv. Um, and the reason we want to do this is because now when I use pip, which is the Python installer program to install Python modules, it's going to install it inside that .venv virtual directory for me. Um, and then this way I can have separate versions of Django everywhere in my project. Um, let's see here. And it looks like it did that pretty quickly. And in fact, if I go into the virtual environment directory, I think if I go into it's maybe include and note that it organizes things by Python version. And if I dig into here, um, There we go. So it's way, 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 way deep in here. It installed Django. And again, you don't need to worry about where it installs this. Um, as you can see, it's it's a couple levels deep here, but it's in this lib direct directory in the virtual environment. And we're never actually going to do work inside that virtual environment directory, that .venv directory. Um, it's more for installing stuff. And then when I'm done working on my project, I can type the activate. Now, if I install something with pip, it won't get installed inside that virtual environment directory. It'll get installed somewhere else. Um, and then when I want to install more stuff on my project, I can just um, do source fem bin activate again. So this is the command that you'll want to remember and, and write down somewhere. And why it's also useful to just always name your virtual environment, environment directories the same thing. And basically each project should have one virtual environment directory. Uh, you That does mean you will be installing Django a whole bunch of times, uh, but it's good practice. And you can always go back and kind of delete these directories um, to clear up space if you're running into issues. And just like any other directory, uh, if for any reason I want to delete it, I can delete it. Uh, Django is now gone. So actually, let me go ahead and, and step through this process again, because we do want to uh, install and use Django. So just to reiterate, I'm going to create a virtual environment 
uh, it's going to be this directory name dot venv. That's in my project directory. I'm going to activate my virtual environment. So when I install stuff, it gets installed inside that directory and it uses that specific version of Python in there. The command prompt tells me that the virtual environment is activated. And now I'm going to use pip to install Python, Django, excuse me. And that will go into si inside that virtual environment directory inside the, the lib folder. And the other thing to note, um, is when I'm working on my Python code, let me close that out. Um, if I do man shift P Python select interpreter, um, I think it should have, picked up on the virtual environment. I'm not quite sure why it did not, to be honest. Um, you don't have to worry about this too much, but it will be. Yeah, I'll come back to that one later. Don't don't worry about that for now. Um, I'll show that later. So this is a bit of a warm up and, and showing you all the, the virtual environment and, and installing Django in our project, right? Um, so now that we've done this, um, we can start to use a bunch of really useful command line tools that get installed with Django. And if I don't misspell which Django admin. Um, it's interesting that's installed there. It's not quite what I would have expected, but that's okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, basically, there's a bunch of command line utilities that Django gives us. We'll see make migrations migrate, um, run server we'll use all the time, start app, start project as well. Um, you'll you'll pretty quickly memorize most of these and you might wanna make a little cheat sheet, but I just sort of want to demo and, and preview some of these a bit. Um, let's actually start a, a Django project. So to do this, we're going to use the Django module. Um, and we're going to, so we're basically passing a series of commands now, right? We're saying Python, use this module Django. Django, <laughs> you can think of these as almost like function names or function arguments. Django, run your start project command, name your project Pokédex, and I want you to create the project here in the current directory, and that's what this dot means. And now if I type ls, um, this Pokédex project has, has been created um, with all sorts of interesting stuff in it. Um, and in fact, I can we can take a look at it and uh, and see what's in there. And let me go ahead and actually get the explorer to where I want it to be. Sorry about that. So I haven't even written any code yet. 
right? This is all configuration and setup from the command line. I've got my Pokedex project. Um, and there's a couple things of interest in here. Um, a lot of this we can ignore. Um, this file, wsgi.py, ignore it. ASGIPY, ignore it. URLs.py, we will do stuff with. Settings.py, we will do stuff with. Note that this manage.py file was created. We will never ever modify this. So like there are certain files that Django will create that we never want to touch, but we'll use this manage py program to do all sorts of things like start and stop our server and things like that. Um, so really you should never ever touch ASGI or WSGI um, or manage py. We will touch settings and URLs. Um, though we need to, now that we're working with this library code from the Django library, we have to work with it in the way that Django wants us to. And you really don't want to go around changing stuff in these files if, if you don't know what that change does. So this settings py file is the settings for the whole Django project. And there's all sorts of things that happen. Django has something called apps, um, which is quite useful. We'll see how we can use it to sort of organize our code, but it's almost like, you know, if you import different classes into a project or like with React, we were importing all these libraries. Um, apps are one way to do similar stuff in Django. And a lot of these apps come with Django when it's installed. And you can see that here, like whenever we have an app we want to use, we have to add it here. And the admin panel is useful. Authentication is really useful. Sessions we'll learn about later. And content types and static files is for things like, you know, CSS files, images, and stuff like that. Um, so this can be really interesting to poke through. Note that this root URL is based on our project name. Um, and then there's just all sorts of other stuff in here that we don't have to worry too much about. We will see how to use Postgres and we'll want to modify this databases um, dictionary here in settings um, a bit later to do that. And then there's a, you can see here, you can set the language that default language that your Django project uses, the time zone. Um, IAN is short for internationalization, which we don't have to worry about. We can tell Django what directory to look in to get CSS and JavaScript assets and stuff like that. So I know this is a lot of stuff, but again, think not shovel, giant excavator. And we're going to learn this um, one, one piece at a time. Um, and let me pause here and, and see what questions people have. Uh, which were the don't touch files again? Oh yeah. Um, ASGI.py and WSGI.py. Uh, to be totally honest though, unless we're explicitly kind of teaching you all, like do modify this file in this way, uh, just don't touch any of this. Um, because as we start building it up, like different directories will be created inside here and all of those need to be in the same spots. So I think the way to think about this is like when I run that Django start project command, which I think it was because it was in the other terminal, but I think it was something like this, like Django start project, you know, Pokedex uh, and so on. Django builds us a house and we're about to like start putting furniture in the house and maybe we like change the curtains and like we install um, uh, a garbage disposal in the sink and stuff. But we really don't want to like, you know, like we don't want to like add on an extra room or like get rid of a room in the house or like make a whole bunch of changes because 
it, it'll break Django. So the rule of thumb here is we'll learn and we'll see like how we work with Django and modify stuff, but you don't want to kind of just go around changing things. Um, and there was another question about the dot with the project name uh, and what will happen. And that is a great question. Um, actually, I'm just catching up on this. Um, so, We can create Django projects um, a couple different ways, actually. And let me go ahead and remove uh, the delete the Pokédex project. Um, and now that that Django project is gone, but the Django library is still installed. Remember. Um, and the question was, what happens if I don't use the dot? Uh, let's let's find out and see what happens. So pr pretty much the same thing, it, it, it installs right here. Um, it installs it in the current directory. If I don't pass a name at all for my project, let's see what happens. And Django, in fact, doesn't like that. We have to give a project name. So it it pretty much whenever you create a Django project, you need to give it a project name. If I wanted to like create the Django project in a different directory, like say a level up, um, I can pass the path to where I want that project to be created. Right now, the project was created a, a level up in my directory folder. Um, but generally speaking, like most of the time, we can just go ahead and do this and say the project name. And whether we put the dot or, or we leave the dot out, it'll just create it in the current directory. Let's see here. Manage PY already exists. Overlaying a project into an existing directory won't replace existing files. Oh, that is a significant difference is um, manage PY getting created there versus like inside the directory, actually. I apologize. Um, so with the dot manage py gets created there. If I don't use the dot, if I go into Pokédex project now, uh, note there's this whole other level like manage py and Pokédex project. Um, a lot of the times it's easier to use the dot just to avoid that extra layer. It just depends how you want to organize your world. So I talked a little bit, um, we poked through this, uh, inside this Pokédex project directory, we poked a little bit around settings PY, and we saw there are these all these things called apps that get installed. And we're actually gonna make apps too, because again, that's how Django sort of organizes its world. Um, it, a little bit like classes, but this is much, much, much higher level. Um, like, so, you know, when you create a new Django project, you're going to create a virtual environment first. You're gonna activate your virtual environment. You're gonna install Django. You're gonna create the Django project. And now we want to create a Django app. And let's see what happens when we do that. 
Um, and again, we use this manage py command for pretty much everything. And we use this command start app. And I'm going to give it, say, app at the end so I don't get too confused with stuff. And note that um, Django has gone ahead. Um, I do need to run this command. Uh, you generally want to run these commands in the same directory where the managed py file lives. But Django has gone ahead and created this Pokemon app directory inside the project. And it's created a whole bunch of other files here. And this is where we're going to add a whole lot of stuff. We're going to see models and apps, admin we won't touch, and you know, and it py we we won't touch. Um what we do have to do is now that we've created this app, we have to tell Django that it exists. So I create a new Django project, I create an app. And the way to think about apps is sort of like how you can create multiple Postgres databases on the same server. Maybe we want one Django backend web framework. Um, if I go over to my sort of TL draw here, My diagram is getting a little terrible. I apologize. But um, let's say this is our Django project. And let's say here's one app. And let's say this is the Pokemon info app. And let's say this is maybe user profiles, accounts, app, right? Let's pretend maybe like for the Pokemon game, you know, you can create a user account and stuff. Well, we can kind of organize our Django project and have one part of it deal with user accounts and user profiles and all that stuff. And another part just deal with like giving information about Pokemon. Um, we won't create lots of different apps, um, but it's it's good to see and it's kind of how Django is organized. So we'll always create at least like one app. Um, and we can kind of dig more into this stuff as we go. Um, but the important thing for now is I create a Django project. I create one app. And then I add that app um, in settings.py so that Django knows it exists. And I think we could actually run our server now, though I don't think we're going to see too much happen. And to do that, I can do Python manage py run server. Don't worry about all these messages right now. Um, We'll touch on those later. And let's see. Yeah, let's actually see what we have when we when we do this. So if I paste in this link that they shared, um, Django is installed. Congratulations. You are seeing this page because debug true is in your settings file, which is uh, hiding. right over there. And we have not configured any URLs. And there's actually a tutorial that, that you can follow. Um, that's that's a pretty good one. Um, and the Django documentation is, is, is pretty solid to go through as well. So there's, so Django, the server's up and running, but it's not doing very much interesting stuff yet, right? So we want to do a couple more things um, to get to get something interesting happening with um, with our Django server. Uh, 
Um, excuse me, I was just kind of collecting my thoughts there. Um, and really the next thing that we're gonna want to do is connect to a database and start doing stuff with the database. If I look in settings PY and I search the file with control F or command F for database, I see that um, here under engine, Django dot database DB backends SQLite three, which is this relational database that's installed by default, but we don't want to use that. We want to use Postgres. So there's a couple things I'm going to do here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and create the Postgres database that we want to use. Um, I'm going to use the create DB command, which is a PSQL command. Um, so I can do it this way, or if I wanted to log into PSQL, I could do it that way as well. I am going to log into PSQL to make sure that that database exists. And it is right there. So it indeed was uh, created as, as hoped. Um, and now we need to tell Django two things. We need to tell Django that we want to use Postgres, and we need to tell it the name of the database that we want to connect to. So here where it says engine, I'm just going to change this to post uh, PostgreSQL, the, the full formal name of Postgres. Um, this name bit, I can simplify dramatically and just have it be the name of the database that we just created, which um, is an easy, easy thing to get wrong. So I'm going to double check that I have the name right. And in fact, I'm just going to run it again to make sure I didn't have any typos. And lo and behold, I do. I have a whole bunch of problems here. But we're going to see what's going on there in a minute. And in fact, so with Django error messages, you'll usually want to go to the top to find the first error message. Um, and so here, I ran the server. It tried to start. It failed. Module not found, psycho PG. Um, another exception, blah, 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 blah. Module not found, psycho PG. So um, this is actually our next step, which is to work with Postgres. We need to install um, a Python library that Django will use called psycho PG. Uh, psycho PG3. And this is this kind of program is called a database adapter. SQL Alchemy is similar. Django uh, uses Psycho PG3 by default. Um, and so we're going to install this library. Django will use that to talk to Postgres. And I'm going to go ahead and I do want to make sure that um, I'm going to kill this server. I do want to make sure my virtual environment's running because again, all of this stuff gets installed inside this lib directory. It's way deep in there, but it's there. Django is there. I want to put psycho PG3 there too so that Django knows how to find it for this project. So I'm just going to do pip install uh, psycho psycho pg, and I am actually going to do a quick sanity check just for myself to make sure that um, my I'm installing this correctly. And so this is good to note. Um, and I actually had forgotten this. When we install Psycho PG, they want us, this is the name of the module they want us to look for. Binary means like something you can run right away. Um, and so this is, and, and this is what we have in our docs. I got a little confused because not every pip module we install, every Python module looks like this. So I just wanted to double check that. But in fact, that is how we install Psycho PG. 
So pip install psycho PG and then in brackets binary. Um, let's see, and I probably have a typo here or I might need quotes. So let's try this one more time. Usually if you try to install something and it doesn't exist, a misspelling is the first good guess. And in this case, it looks like I just needed the quotes so that um, probably with the brackets, um, the shell understanding this correctly could be done. Um, and I might as well upgrade my pip like they're asking while I'm doing this, um, which won't hurt anything. And in fact, if I type out this command, I believe it's pip. Um, pip requirements freeze. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's so much simpler than I thought. If I just type out this command, pip freeze, this prints out all everything we've installed, all the Python modules we've installed that are in that directory, in the virtual environments directory. And here we see Django, PsychoPG, the exec, executable binary for PsychoPG and a couple other sort of things that those want that got installed. And in fact, what I can do is use this sort of command line um, piping command to put this into a file named requirements.txt. And now up here, I have a text file in the special format um, that like, I do want to check into version control and other people can use with pip to um, build my whole project with all of its Python dependencies. So this is the equivalent of package JSON from the JavaScript world for Python projects. So we've gone ahead and just to recap, I've installed Psycho PG2. I have updated this database to use Postgres. I'm gonna run my server with manage py just to make sure nothing is broken. And it does seem to be running. Uh, we're not gonna get anything interesting there like we saw before. So I don't worry, I'm not caring about that right now. I just wanted to make sure that I installed Psycho PG2 and everything was done correctly. Um, so now we're actually going to get to the interesting part. Um, and let me catch up in the chat. Um, I'm just catching up in the chat. And actually while I'm doing this, um, do folks have any questions? And is sort of the pay, is this sort of a useful, good pace to kind of walk through this stuff? I have a question. Uh, what did we write under the app part? Or like, you know, in settings under app, I suppose. Oh yeah, absolutely. Great question. So I ran this, we ran this command, Python manage py. Uh, I, I, th there are a lot of commands. And in fact, I do recommend creating a little cheat sheet. I don't have most of these commands memorized. Um, start app was the command. And we did Pokemon app. And that created this um, Pokemon app directory inside the whole project. And then what we have to do, and, and to, to get back to your question, Clarice, is um, with any Django app, whether it's one that we create or one that's being used by default that someone else has created, or maybe if, if we wanted to use someone else's Django app, in settings PY, we have to add it to the list of installed apps. And every time the Django server starts, it'll look at this list and it'll go through and, um, 
and find find the different apps. And here, because these say Django doc contrib, it looks in a different place. Like if we dig through the Django code and, and the virtual environment directory, we can find it here because it's just like this. It's just the name. Django knows, hey, just look in my project directory in, um, in fact, let me, uh, oh, did I do this in the wrong? Oh no, it did this at the top level, I think. I apologize. Um, yeah, this, the, I, I apologize. I, the Django project structure, I still get a little confused by sometimes. Um, and maybe this all did belong in one more nested directory to make life a little easier. But in essence, what Django is doing is it's looking through the, the root directory uh, which I believe is where this managed PY file is um, for a directory named Pokemon app. Um, but if we don't put this here, then Django won't know to do that. Um, and I will circle back to make sure I have my structure correct here. Um, I will, we can check on that one in a bit later. Um, Andrew, great question about a message, an error message that came up earlier, unapplied migrations. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and also we do have some cheat sheets to, to share with all of you. Um, what other questions do people have? Uh, just real quick. Um, did you make... What modifications did you make to that TXT file? Or did you make any? Oh, to requirements.txt? Correct. Great question. Uh, we don't want to create this file ourselves. We use pip to generate it. If I type this command pip freeze, it prints out to the command line everything that's been installed in this virtual environment, in this Python project. And it doesn't matter if I deactivate or restart the virtual environment or whatever, because all this stuff is just installed inside that .venv directory. Um, this little caret arrow command, this is a shell command. It pipes the output from one program into something else, in this case, into a text file. And so I use that to create the requirements.txt file. Yeah, we wouldn't want to create this manually or modify it. We we want Pip to do that work for us. Got it. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, I thought you had made changes to the txt document. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And Francisco, thank you for mentioning this in in the chat. And I think this is an excellent point. Um, that the Think of these different Python apps as like ice cream and um, the project settings as like the freezer. And any command that gets run through our Django application will first be referenced in our project settings. And from there, it'll figure out where to go through looking through settings or URLs, which we'll look at um, in a couple minutes. And give me just one moment, folks. I think I have an alarm going off that I need to turn off. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let's take a look at at models and then maybe like I think some routes and putting all the pieces together. Um, and actually, Francisco, if you're there, can I get a sanity check if this Pokemon app directory got put in the right spot or not? Uh, Pokemon app. Um... Yes. It's okay. Right. Thank you. I always get confused if it belongs inside the Pokemon project directory or not. No, no, no. The, the project and the app, are, they go side by side. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I, fi I figured as much. Um, let's see here. And I think actually, let's do a little bit of, no, let's, let's build our models and then we'll, and then I think we'll start adding routes and, and views. Um, so we're kind of starting from the bottom up here, um, especially because we've just been looking at a lot of, of Postgres. And we will see in a bit how with Django we can, like, you know, we need to see stuff to start showing up in our browser. Um, but spending some time now with this stuff under the hood is actually going to help us a lot. Um, and so in that spirit, let's talk a little bit about models. Um, and actually let me quickly look at my references to see if there's anything that we want to grab here. Yeah, let's just build the model. Let's do it. So mo once we've created an app, most of our work is going to go in here. Um, there's a little bit we'll do at the project level that we'll see a bit later. But most of the work is here. So a model. Let me very quickly do a little bit of illustration about a model. And I think we'll use maybe, I'm, I'm just going to use sort of, I think, uh, I'll use something that's a bit more of a square. That's not what I wanted. A Django model is just a, it's, uh, it's just a Python class that Django treats in a special way. And we use it to represent and interact with data in Postgres. So we might have a Pokemon table in Postgres, but in Django and in all of the Python code we write with Django, we're going to use this model to interact with that data. And these two things are connected. And it'll help, I think, to see when I build it in just a moment. Um, the key things here to remember are Django does the work. We're not actually going to write any SQL ourselves. Django will do the work. We then can use this Pokemon model class to interact with the data. The data still lives in Postgres and it's still tables and, and rows. And it's important for us to understand how that works, but we're not using it directly. And again, think of sort of the metaphor of, you know, you can use a shovel, but if you need to excavate a whole bunch, we need to use uh, an, an excavator. So let's go ahead and, and build this. And look, just to reiterate where, where I am, um, I'm in our Django app, in Pokemon app. And this is, the app is sort of like to use Francisco's metaphor of, of the ice cream and the freezer. If the freezer is the whole Django project, 
each app is a different flavor of ice cream. You know, I eat, if, if I buy ice cream, I eat it right away. So I really only keep like one thing of ice cream at a time. Like, and that's perfectly fine. Just to have like one kind of ice cream in my freezer. And a lot of the time we will just have one kind of ice cream in the freezer. And that's, that's the app. But if I want to eat ice cream, I can't just eat it out from an empty freezer. I need at least one thing of ice cream. So um, we're doing this work inside the Pokemon app. Django has already helpfully created this models file and added this import statement for us. Um, so again, we're doing stuff the Django way. And we're going to create a class named Pokemon. And it needs to inherit, right, which we've seen a little bit, but not a lot of, from this other class, models.model. That's like the Django model class. And that has all the stuff under the hood for talking to Postgres and some cool things with querying and things like that that we'll see in a bit. Our Pokemon is going to get a name and I'll give it a dot string so this doesn't complain. And if this char field looks a little similar to like the Varchar type in Postgres, it should. It should look pretty much exactly the same. And so we're adding properties on our class that will become columns in our table. And Django will do that work for us with Psycho PG2. And you can see all of these options. Some of these should look familiar from Postgres, primary key, unique, null, all these different things. Our Pokemon also has a level. Excuse me, that should be um that should that should have been indented. And again, for really every property on our model, we need to use um, something from this, this models class that has bundled up all the different kinds of, of properties and, and fields. And we'll call this integer field and we'll give it a default value of one. And that's it. Um, this is a Pokemon class. It's going to directly map to a Pokemon table in our database that Django will create for us. Um, and now we need to go ahead and do that. And that comes to um, what Andrew was asking earlier about migrations, where, let's see if the error message shows up again. If I run my server, yeah, we got this warning. We have 18 unapplied migrations. Our project may not work properly until I apply the migrations for app, admin, auth, content, sessions, and so on. These are all, by the way, those default apps that are installed in settings py, just, just so you know where it comes from. And it's telling us what to run. Python manage.py migrate to apply them. Um, So migrations, all changes to a database schema are done with a migration file. We never want to modify our DB schema directly. This makes it easier to change things in a controlled fashion and, and has a lot of other advantages that we will see.
to create a migration, we run this command make migrations and Django does the work for us. The database isn't changed yet. This just creates a migration file. And I think once you all see this in action, it'll it'll be more straightforward. So applying migrations, think of it as the same thing as when we ran those SQL files, like init.sql against the database. Whenever we apply migration files, Django looks at the migration file. Django turns it into SQL. Django executes that SQL on our database. And this is all done automatically. So let's go ahead, creating migrations. Whenever I modify a Django model, I need to create a migration for that. I need to create a migration. And uh, I think I'll demonstrate that very briefly here. I've got my Pokemon class right here. Let's create a migration. Um, and why do I have all those things open? Django tells me what it did. It tells me where it did it. Uh, we don't have to, if I look inside here, I never, ever, ever want to directly modify this migrations file. I modify the models. And then Django does this because it's doing a whole bunch of stuff under the hood. But we can see it's like gonna create a Pokemon. It's giving it all these fields and all these other things. Now let's say I want to give the Pokemon another property. Um, let's say I want to give it a primary key ID. Uh, let's see here. And in fact, I need to uh, do a quick double check here of what that looks like in a model. I, I apologize if this may actually, Django is doing that for us by default. I totally forgot there. So let's come up with something else. Um, is in stable. I am not a Pokemon expert. So we're not going to worry too much about this. But it's going to be a, defoolian, a Boolean field, and the default will be false. So this new field that I added on this model is not in that migration file, right? Django doesn't really know about this. So let me run make migrations again. And now, Django has created another migration file, number two. And this one just adds this field, Boolean field. And again, you all, we never modify these directly. 
and you don't have to know the ins and outs of, of these migration uh, files. So don't worry too much about that. I just want to point out they're created in order. This also, like if there's already data that exists, this lets us manage that. Um, it's not SQL. Django will turn it into SQL. Um, so I've created my migrations. Now let's actually update our, our database, right? Because if I go to the Pokédex, there's nothing in it. Let's actually run these migrations. And this will also run some other migrations that, that we don't see here because they're sort of installed with Django for all of those apps that are already installed. And so we do always have to run this uh, migrate command to get a Django project properly set up and, and ready to run. So it did all this stuff. Um, later on, we can see the actual SQL if we want where like a migration, like migrations files create and stuff like that. Um, now, if I go to my Pokédex directory, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here all of a sudden. All these tables that Django created, stuff about authentication and users and permissions and Django admin and Django content types. But we also have our Pokémon. Right, so to reiterate, with Django, we're not going to be writing the SQL ourselves. And I apologize that this TL draw is is not working as as well as I hope because I want to. There we go. Django created this Pokemon table for us in Postgres. We create the model in Django. We then tell Django to create migrations from a model and Django uses those to modify Postgres into SQL. Um, and I think the last bit I wanna share and then we'll take a break and, and get some hands-on time is um, another tool that Django gives us to interact with our models um, in, in a really useful way. So a couple things to note. Um, now that we're doing this, this new way with models, I need to be really careful about directly inserting data too. Um, you know, note like Django created this ID primary key for us by default even though um, it's not in the models directory, which I got a little confused about. And there will be more and more stuff like this as we go. So it's sort of like once you're on the Django path, you want to stay on the Django path. And if I start messing too directly uh, with stuff in Postgres, then it might uh, mess stuff up, though we can. And, and later we'll sort of see how. Brian, yes, sir. Hey, um, it looks like name did not appear on your um, table. Oh, you are absolutely right. It did not. That is a good point. Um, are see. you missing commas? Yes. After oh, level? Yeah. I am missing commas. I'm missing commas there. No, there shouldn't be any commas at the end of those. I, I didn't have oh, commas. Well, maybe it's because I had a comma. Thank you so much, Francisco. That is an excellent point. Uh, that was a, an unforced error or it was not on purpose. Um, that is a very good catch. Um, and in fact, I should update like my VS code extensions. I will, and in fact, it was telling me disallow trailing comma. I, I wish VS code would have told me a little more with something like really bright and red. Um, okay, so actually let's see, let's see how to fix this. I have just changed my model. I found a bug that I made that I need to get rid of. So now that I've changed the model, I need to make a new migration.
it is impossible to add a non-nullable field name to a Pokemon without specifying a default. This is because the database needs something to populate existing rows. Interesting. This is maybe because we've already created this and Django doesn't know there's any data in there. Um, it's giving us two options. Provide a one-off default value now. Create a manually defined a value. Let's provide a one-off default value. Please enter the default value as valid Python. Uh, none. Okay, so that seemed to have worked. So if I look at my third <laughs> migration, we've added our name field. The default is none, which I, unless I've lost my mind, is basically null. Uh, I right, this is Python's null. Um, and now when I run these migrations, um, hopefully all of that should work, and that'll be added to our table. So let's go ahead and do that as well. And we run the migrate command and we apply all migrations. And now if I go into my database and I look at the Pokemon table, uh, we do indeed have a name field. That was a great catch, Brian. And actually that was a great little sort of workflow to see, which is exactly how we're supposed to use models and migrations. Um, and this does add this extra step but it makes everything more reproducible and easier, and it lets Django know what's going on. Um, and it lets us do some very cool things, um, both in our code and with what's called the Django shell, um, or the Django console, excuse me. So this should look a little bit like the Python REPL that we've seen. Right, if I just run hello on the command line. And it is, it is normal Python. We can do all of our python -y stuff in here, but we also get access to our Django program. I'm going to import my Pokemon model. Um, and now if I haven't gotten anything wrong, I should be able to use my model code because this is just a Python class to create a Pokemon. And this is kind of awesome. Now, note that I'm jumping over to the other terminal tab where I have Postgres. And you'll want to have, you'll probably want multiple tabs. You can split these two if you want to see two at the same time. There's no Pokemon right now in that Pokemon table. I've created this model but it only exists in this in this Django console that's running. And when I quit it, it'll go away. If I want to save my Pokemon, I can use this save command. And that's the same thing as an insert statement. And now I've got a Pokemon. And so what we'll see a bit later is how in other parts of our code, I can start, you know, doing stuff like this. Just for fun, we'll put the level there. I can do the exact same thing in my Django code. And I can connect it 
we're going to see how to use URLs and routes in a little bit so that we get all the pieces here, right? Where the browser can send a get request with the Pokemon name and level or post request. And then we can save it to the database. Um, but the great thing here is that I can, in the Django console, I can create Pokemon. Let me go ahead and create another one. These are the only two Pokemon I know. I'm sad to say. Um, and we can also query and do very cool stuff with querying. There's a bunch of different ways to do this, um, but the easiest one looks something like this. And in fact, maybe we can do all pokey, all pokey sub one. Dot name. Right. So what I just did was I said, Django, get all instances of our Pokemon model, give them back to me. And now I can work interact with them just like normal Python. So, and that's the great thing about models is like, we don't actually have to directly write the SQL now. Django will do that for us. Um, and we can use models and Python to interact with them. However, because it is, you know, Postgres um, under the hood, it is really important to know how that works because we're going to use foreign keys and all those same things. Um, so let me just pause and see what questions people have, and, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll work on some code. Um, so what, what questions do people have? Cause I know I did cover a good amount of ground here. Derek. Yes, sir. Um, why is the Pokemon being presented to you as an object? Like it, so I'm assuming on Postgres, like all of those attributes are, are there sort of like raw data types and then it's just getting abstracted to you as an object or is there like, is it being stored differently than, than we've seen previously um, with, with Postgres? Great question. It is stored exactly the same way. If I go into my database, remember I've got somewhere in here, my, my Pokemon table. And if we do select star, and I highly recommend everyone to um, be using PSQL to look at the data as well, especially for learning purposes. It's stored just exactly in that same way. Um, sometimes a model, like as they start to get complex, like we might start to see columns, like maybe for certain columns that are more complex, like two or certain fields on the model that are more complex, we'll see two columns created or, or some things where these aren't like in perfect correspondence, but generally speaking, um, it's a pretty clear correspondence though though it does start to get more like interactive and and richer um and django does start to add more and more postgres on top of stuff but generally speaking yes like the metaphor to think of is i create the model django turns the model into a table with columns um and then when i want to put data in there or get it out i just do it through the model um and the advantage of that being we can write Python code, right? Def, get, Pokemon, uh, P equals, I'm sort of making up this query. So this is probably not 100% right, but it's in the ballpark. Um, so it, this is another layer to learn, but it lets us do some very powerful things and, and it's Python. So, um, so now we want to 
right? I talked a little bit about like conceptual and logical data models and all that stuff. Well, we're basically, we just moved a level up in terms of sort of our data modeling where I need to kind of know how SQL works, but I'm not going to explicitly write the SQL for every table and column and query. Instead, I'm going to be creating these models and using those to interact with my data, but it still gets stored in the way that we've seen. Uh, does that help a bit? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, and Francisco makes an excellent point. Django models are still, it's still object-oriented programming and, and Python. Um, we can use like inheritance and, and dunder method, methods and all these things. Um, yeah, it, it, it's that's the cool thing. It's all Python at the end of the day. Um, what other questions do people have or bits of this you'd like to go over? I guess uh, my question is, so for the models.py, that's where we would just do our create tables, but the views would be like our functions and putting the data in sort of thing. Right. And the views are really the next step here. Um, and let's see if maybe we can quickly, there's really two pieces here that are the next step. Um, let's see how far we can get, in fact. Um, I think probably create Pokemon. Let's see if I can't get the create Pokemon working, though. I feel like I probably am not going to be able to get this working um, off the cuff. Um, yeah, but I, I'll, I'll just kind of sketch out what happens with views. And then we'll actually dig into it later. Um, but to sketch out at like a very high level, there's this URLs py file. And I might do something like this. And it might do something like this. Um, I would need to import this, but Pokemon, I don't know, app.models.create. Pokemon. And again, this is a bit of a sketch, so for forgive me. Um, but then we might do something like this. Uh, I don't know, what is it? For create Pokemon name. Pikachu, we probably want this to be like a, a post request, but just to illustrate. So whether it's with the browser or React code or something like this, we would in that HTTP request to this particular URL, send the information. In this URLs file, we'll learn how to tell Django what requests to look for. And exactly like you were saying, what view function to call. Actually, this should be views. But we'll see that later. That's we really just kind of want to look at at models to get started. But you you are correct, Clarice, that like um to to kind of map it out a bit more, in fact. And I think then this is a good time for a break. Uh you know, path. Um, again, I'm sort of making this up, but in our URLs file, we would say, hey, Django, listen on this URL for this request. When you get it, call this view function. Hey, view function, use this model to create data or read data or whatever and send it back. And that would be like the whole kind of flow. Um, but that's getting uh, a couple steps ahead. 
Um, and we really like just to start with, excuse me, just to start with, we're just going to kind of focus on, I apologize. I wanted that to be the models. We're going to focus on this bit to start with. Um, because this is sort of where we get the most bang for our buck and where we found it often is a bit, it can take a little while for people to wrap your head around. It. But but that's sort of the whole flow. Um, yeah, great, great question, Clarice. Um, what other questions do people have? John, yes, sir. Uh, could you go over again how you connected the Postgres database? Yes, absolutely. Um, and after this, I think let's take a break so that then when we come back, we can do a little bit of hands-on time with stuff. Um, connecting to the Postgres database, that part is not so bad. And this is sort of the power of Django. In this settings.py file, all the way down where it says databases. And this is where like search is your friend. If you remember this said this default stuff before some other relational database, SQLite. Um, I don't want you to go away. In settings py, we just go ahead and change the database engine to be PostgreSQL, Postgres, and we give it the name of the database that we created. And I installed PsychoPG2. Remember, I did a... Uh... Hit install PsychoPG. And I apologize, it's not version two, it's version three. Um, and this is the, the program, the Python module that Django uses to talk to Postgres. So I tell Django, talk to Postgres. Then I install what Django needs to talk to Postgres. And then Django does all that work. And then when I run this command, make migrations, I say, Django, look at my models, look at what's changed, create migration files that describe what you're going to do to Postgres. And then once it's done that, I say, Django, all right, I want you to change stuff in the database now. And Django says, cool, let me look at the migration files. Hey, we already ran them. There's no changes I need to make. But if there had been a change like we saw before, that's when Django actually then creates new tables and columns and stuff like that. Um, what other questions do people have? And did that help a bit, John? Oops. And yes. Uh, did you also create your database in the terminal? With, I, um, um, when you yeah. install Postgres, there's a command create DB. But I could have just logged into SQL and done it this way as well. It really doesn't matter. It's a uh, personal preference. However you want to create the database in Postgres, Django doesn't care. All Django cares about is that the database exists. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Totally. Good question. Let's take, um, let's take 10. And then when we come back, let's, um, do some, some like pair or, or group work and, and do a little bit of model building ourselves. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. And see you all in 10 minutes.